All right, welcome everyone. We are here to discuss um, um, uh, an entity that is described in our book. This is, I'm Sanjay Mukhopadhyay and this is my colleague, Dr. Matt Cicchini. And we together wrote a book that we are hoping is going to be useful for trainees as well as practicing pathologists. And we hope that we are um, uh, approaching this in a new fashion in terms of describing things in terms of where you find them, whether you find them in a small biopsy or at frozen section or on dissections. So here's a case. Welcome, Matt, by the way. Welcome. Hi, Sanjay. Uh, so we're going to just talk about this case, Matt. Let's just walk people yeah. through how we have walked people through this entity in our book. So we've got a... So a resection case? Yeah. So this would be in our resection specimen chapter. Yeah. You can see there's a lot of lung around it. There's some blood there. Yeah. And then there's obviously a nodule. So Matt, I'll leave it to you to describe a little bit. I'll take it in and out and take it over. Go yeah, ahead. so it looks like we have a, a first at low power here. Actually, this kind of caught my eye. These kind of like hemorrhagic spaces there that almost look like blood lakes, I think that you could describe them as. Um, and then the this lesion seems relatively well demarcated against the adjacent lung there. And then the, the lesion itself seems a little bit heterogeneous where we have these areas of this blood-filled blood lakes. Um, at this low power, I'm also seeing that there's some more of this hyalinized type stroma here that looks very pink. Um, and then we have areas that are a bit more cellular and they seem to have a range of uh, patterns at this low power. Um, and then in some other areas, it looks a little bit more gray. I wonder if there's some accumulation of some foamy macrophages in there as well. Hmm. Okay, so let me take you yeah. to higher mag in each of these areas. So here's the first area you described. Yeah, so this, this is this area where we have this accumulation of, of blood. Um, it looks like there's some intervening kind of fine, delicate spaces in there that are lined by these cells that are a little bit cuboidal. Um, it's a little bit hard to see with some of that hemorrhage in there, but I think we'll be able to see the cells a little bit better in some of the other areas. Yeah. That's great. And then let's get you to these uh, sclerotic areas that you noticed. At yeah. The so this, this very pink sclerotic areas that have these intervening areas of these more epithelial looking cells in between them. Yeah. And then let's try to take you to one of those cellular areas that you mm -hmm. noticed. So how about something like this, Matt? Yeah, so it is quite cellular once again. Um, the, the one thing I am noticing is that while it's cellular, the cells themselves don't look that atypical. They're a bit more bland um, than I would I think in a typical adenocarcinoma type of uh, picture. Um, I, I, I assume this was taken out for a suspected um, mass or lesion. Um, Yes. Was it a traditional patient or was there anything uh, different about this? Yeah, I, I think it was a slightly younger woman. I don't know okay. the, the exact uh, age, but uh, I do. I Yes, a woman and a slightly younger. So it's not quite the uh, traditional for an, yeah. you know, for a non-small cell carcinoma, which would be generally an older patient or at least a 50s, 60s. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And I, so I think that there's some um, cells that are, look a little bit more here like type 2 reactive pneumocytes. And then inside here, there's some other uh, kind of a little bit more distinct cell population that seems to be more growing in kind of solid areas in between these areas that are lined by these type two looking appearing cells. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think these lung masses, you always need to think about a lung cancer, but I think, you know, given that the history is a little bit off for this one too, and, and we're seeing um, some other features that are not really completely typical for a traditional lung um, adenocarcinoma, I think we should think of some other diagnostic possibilities. Um, yeah, so, so, you know, Matt, we talk about this two-cell population, yeah. in this tumor in our book. Can you explain to the audience what the two-cell population is? Yeah, so we have one cell population here, which I'm just kind of highlighting there. Um, so these would be these type two appearing uh, cuboidal cells that kind of have a bit of a hobnail appearance to them. Um, and so these are, are um, will, will stain like an epithelial cell. Um, and then the other population is these round cell population here, um, which are also somewhat bland, um, but they kind of grow in more of this sheet-like pattern here. Um, and they have the, these round to oval nuclei. And these ones should have a very distinct staining pattern where they'll be TTF1 positive, but keratin negative. And that can be really helpful in making this diagnosing of a sclerosing pneumocytoma. 
Yeah. So all you need really is a TTF one and a keratin, right, man? Yeah. What about if you had other differentials? Like if if some mm. if somebody was wondering if they looked only at this land population and wondering, well, could this be a carcinoid tumor? What could you do to rule that out? Uh, definitely. Well, you could do some neuroendocrine markers um, yeah. to rule it out. To me, the chromatin's not perfect for it. You know, right. I guess salt and pepper is a bit in the eye of the beholder, but um, the other thing is to me, it doesn't have that nested architecture. So it, to me, it doesn't have architecture um, or uh, nuclear features of neuroendocrine differentiation. And I'm always hesitant to put um, neuroendocrine stains on something that doesn't have clear neuroendocrine differentiation. Uh, Cause then sometimes you get some positive staining and you don't know what to do with it. I don't know how you feel about that Sanjay. Yes, no, I think that's that's correct. I also hesitate to put, um, uh, you know, neuroendocrine stains on things that sh don't look neuroendocrine. And I think we we also mentioned this point in our book. We make a yeah. point to um, emphasize this. Definitely, because the scrolling pneumocytoma should be negative for neuroendocrine markers. Right? Correct. They should be ne negative for neuroendocrine markers. So I think we have covered most of the histologic clues and yeah. really the immunohistochemical profile of this tumor. Also worth mentioning that at the periphery, this can look very papillary yeah, and complex. And so definitely there is a there is a possibility to mistake this for an adenocarcinoma. But you were also right about the foamy macrophages, Matt, and that also serves as a clue. So if you put it all together, the foamy macrophages, the sclerosis, the two cell population, and importantly, that the resection is from a woman, I think you have a pretty good, strong diagnosis here. Yeah. So, 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 Sanjay, could you just comment on some um, some uh, trip, uh, t t tips or tricks on what to do with this at frozen section? Because I can imagine that this would be really hard on frozen section to not call adenocarcinoma, especially given those areas with papillary growth and things. Yeah, I think it, it can be tough and you, you can be misled. I think you should be on your guard anytime you're looking at a frozen section from a woman, especially if it's from a relatively young woman. And then again, look for the same things, the same features, the two cell populations, sclerosis, foamy macrophages. But one thing you can do is talk to your surgeon or look up the CT. I know, Matt, you do this in preparation yeah, for your frozens. And there it really helps because in most cases, this will show a sort of well-circumscribed small nodule. Okay. And that should also, you should it should put you on your guard because if you're considering in the differential a low-grade adenocarcinoma because of the low-grade cytology of the cells, or some sort of a lipidic type adenocarcinoma, those should usually be ground glass, or at least partially ground glass lesions. So if you see a solid small lesion that corresponds to this histology in a woman, I think those are clues to back off from adenocarcinoma and at least suggest a sclerosing pneumocytoma. You might not be able to, on a frozen, do it with 100% certainty. Of, you know, you don't have access to immunostains. Fine. But maybe you could suggest it or say defer to permanence and not call it malignant. That's the main important thing. Yeah. I'm not sure if you're aware, so what's the, the typical management of these cases? Like if you were to make this diagnosis on a smaller biopsy, do they typically conservatively remove them or do they follow these? Or? Yeah, I think you could follow it. I think there's an argument for following it, but I think in, in my experience, they will resect them. They'll resect it with a wedge resection. Okay. Um, I, I don't know why they do that. Is, is it because they just want to be sure that it is benign, you know, yeah. whereas a small biopsy diagnosis can be difficult? Um, but yes, I think the, the main thing is to avoid a lobectomy, which okay. would be unnecessarily aggressive surgery for this. But I think a wedge resection is reasonable, okay. um, you know, just to remove the lesion. But these are completely benign. So yeah. theoretically, you could avoid a resection completely. <laughs> That's a good point. So I guess the, the, the important role for the pathologist here in frozen section is that we could prevent a patient from needing a lobectomy by making this diagnosis of a sclerosing pneumocytoma. Absolutely. All right. Thank you very okay. much, Matt. This was Thank a you. really uh, interesting discussion. And I hope that our uh, the readers of our book and viewers of the uh, Innovative Pathology YouTube channel find this uh, discussion helpful too. Wonderful. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone.